Well, good morning, everyone. So glad you're here to worship with us. Those of you that are home joining online, just like to welcome you as well. Aren't you kind of glad that this week some of the humidity is going to be going away? So muggy, right? All right, so we're, we're going to have a little fun. It's kind of summer. A lot of people are on vacation. We're going to have a little bit of fun today. How many of you love chocolate? Just really like to eat chocolate. How would you just like to have a chocolate bar right now? How many of you just like to have a chocolate bar right now? All right, now here's the deal. We're going to have a little fun this morning. All right, so there's a bunch of chocolate bars hidden in this room right now. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those Sundays, right? <laughs> You're ready to go home now, right? All right, so here's the deal. They're taped underneath some of the chairs. All right, now here's the deal. Here's the deal. All right, now I want to see everybody. Put your hands up. All right, everybody slow down. Look at you guys. You're like, oh, mine, 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 mine. <laughs> right? All right, so every chair that's got a blue dot next to it, and there might be not even somebody in that row, it's got a blue dot on the right front leg, you've got a candy bar taped underneath your chair. So I want you to carefully, because you could break the candy bar, slowly peel that tape off and grab that candy bar. And if you're sitting in a row or you see a row where nobody's grabbing it, go and grab that candy bar. And once you grab that candy bar, I want you to reach up and hold that up in the air so everybody can see your candy bar. All right, look at, yeah, there's, there's only a couple of them. All right, everybody hold your candy bars up so we can see. All right, all right, all right. How many got candy bars? Some of you are still searching. We're going to be here all day looking for candy bars. All right, who all got a candy bar? Hey, there's even some back there. You got one back there, all right? I put you in that room, see? So you guys didn't even know. Look at that. All right, Alan. So yeah, so you, you can go grab it. Go ahead. Oh, you got it. All right. That's all right, because here's the deal. Let me see, hold your candy bars up. Hold your candy bars up. All right, now here's the deal. Everybody that got a candy bar, here's the challenge. I want you to go find somebody in the room you don't know, and I want you to give it to them, but I don't want you just to give it to them. I want you to say a quick little prayer for them. Yeah, we're going to get you out of your comfort zone this morning, all right? And this is going to tie in what we're doing today, all right? So, yeah, don't hide that candy bar, Nicole. You pick it back up. Yeah, I see that. You can't get away. This whole church is looking at you right now. <laughs> everybody grab, everybody stand up with their candy bar, right? I know, I'm getting you out of comfort zone. You're going to see why. Go find somebody you don't know. Have a little bit of fun. Just, it's a really short prayer. Say, all you got to do is say, I bless you in Jesus' name. That's all you got to do. Something simple like that. And then hand them the candy bar. All right, you guys are doing, doing well. All right, if you didn't go and pray, let's all pray for that person that did. <laughs> all right, now, now here's the deal. Here's the deal. Here's why I wanted to start with that. Because it was exciting getting that candy bar, wasn't it? Right? But it's a little bit harder. Like if I just said, just go and give it away, you're like, oh, yeah, I can go give it away to somebody. It's a little bit of a, you know, kind of, uh, I just got, it was, church was exciting for a moment. And then it got a little sad, and then it was like all of a sudden when I said to go pray for somebody, all of a sudden all those butterflies inside you were like. Now here's what I want you to think. I was watching a video clip this week. It just reminded me of what happened on 9-11, all right, and how many people were running for their lives because those twin towers were hit by airplanes, and they were afraid of dying, and many people died that day. And while people were running for their lives, there were other men and women who were strong and brave and courageous who ran into the face of danger with their lives to rescue as many as they could. Now, my challenge for us as a church is that what God has called us to is something much greater than what happened at 9-11. The cost is so much greater. And I want to start off, we're going to study, we're going to study the book of Joshua. We started last week, and I'm going to tie this all together. But I want to start off by looking at a passage in Scripture to kind of, kind of jar us a little bit this morning into really what we're called to and what's really at stake in our lives. So let's open up to um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 through 9. It'll be up here on the side screens. And this is what the Apostle Paul wrote to a church that's under heavy persecution. I mean, these guys are, many are, are dying. They're under heavy persecution. He's writing to this church. He's trying to challenge them to hang on, hold on to the hope that you have in Christ. And this is what he wrote, starting in the second part of verse 7. He wrote, this will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire. He's talking about when Jesus returns, all right? That's what our hope is in, for our Savior to return. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. Verse 8, 
He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Verse 9, they will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Now, I don't know about you, but as a Christ follower, when I read those verses, that is very sobering. To think how many people died over the last year in the midst of a pandemic and all the craziness that's going on in our culture right now, and how we're more concerned, as you hear me say, over masks and vaccines and everything else and all worked up, and we're not worked up about the fact that people are facing crisis eternity every day, every minute. And it should jar us. It should change us. And that God has called us to something so much bigger than what happened at 9-11. God has called us to proclaim the good news of our Savior to a lost and dying world that the enemy has blinded their minds so they don't understand the good news of Christ. And he's, he's commissioned us and he's entrusted us with this good news that we have in Christ. And so as excited as we are in this life that we have in Christ, we have got to give it away. And we have to go out in the face of danger and all of the, the butterflies and our stomachs and everything else that just holds us back and keeps us timid. we got to step out and be strong and courageous in faith. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. This is God pep-talking Joshua before he goes into this land. Today we're just be looking at just being courageous, to be courageous. As I said last week as we started this book, Joshua is a little timid right now. He's got, you know, he's got some big shoes to fill after, he's, you know, after Moses is dead. Now, Joshua's the one that God has appointed to go into the promised land to lead his people. And as I shared with you last week, there's all kinds of craziness going on in the land. The culture was just a mess. All kinds of different cultures and nations, all kinds of sexual immorality and, and just yeah, idolatry. And as I shared last week, archaeological studies showed that they, would, they were killing babies. They were taking young children and placing them in clay pots and suffocating them. And they found them in, in the walls of their temples. It was a, it was a form of worship that, that our, you know, history has recorded them doing, sacrificing to their gods. And so as God's getting ready to send his people in into the land, God is now challenging challenging Joshua to stay focused, to stay focused as they're moving forward into all that's in front of him. And there's giants in the land. He was one of the 12 spies that went into the land, and many of them brought back a bad report. But Joshua and Caleb, as I said last week, were very different. They're like, look, we can do this. But now reality kind of hits you in the face, right? I've actually got to do this thing, and, 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 and am I willing to do it? And it's all this resistance and all this fear that we can have and, and stepping out in faith and trusting. And this is what Joshua's going through right now. And God's got him in the locker room before the big game. He says, look, look, buddy, I want to encourage you. You can do this. You've got what it takes, right? We're going to move forward, you know? So he's trying to get him out of his comfort zone to move into this land. So I want to just kind of pick up what we did last week, and then we're going to go on. I want to look at back at verses 1 and 2. Starting at Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. As I said last week, God spoke to Moses, and now he's speaking to Joshua. All right, as I said last week, if there's one thing we need right now in the midst of the times that we live in is we need to hear the voice of God and to clearly hear God's word God's voice speaking into our lives. And Joshua needed this. He's getting ready to go in. Verse 2, Moses, my servant, is dead. This is God speaking to him. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people. I just want to pers you know, personalize it for us today. This is our time, right? This is our time to lead. This is our time to move forward into all that God has for us. And so God has given him this pep talk. He says, you're going to go. You're going to want it. It's your time to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan into the land that I'm giving them. Now, I'm, I'm sure when Joshua was hearing God say these words, he's sitting there just thinking, there's these thoughts. You know how it is, like, you know, when I'm preaching, you've got all these thoughts going through your head. Isn't it amazing? You drive down the road and get all these weird thoughts in your head, right? And he's like, how did I get there, right? I'm sure Joshua's got all these thoughts in his head. And he's probably sitting there and he's thinking, God, but I'm not Moses. I wasn't there when I fled Egypt, you know, after he killed that Egyptian and, and went. And then God, you know, there's this burning bush on the mountain. He goes up the mountain, and then God speaks to him and reveals himself to him. And he's like, well, and he says, go back and tell him to let my people go. He says, well, who's going to send me? And he hears those, those words saying, I am who I am, right? And, and Joshua's thinking, I wasn't there. 
I wasn't the one that, that took the rod and, and, you know, and stood before Pharaoh and threw my, my staff down and it turned into a serpent. I wasn't the one that raised it over the Red Sea and part of the Red Sea. I wasn't the one that, that led you know, God's people just to experience all these crazy things. It wasn't me, God. Yes, I went up the mountain with Moses, but I only went part of the way. He's the one that went up to the top and, and saw your presence and got the Ten Commandments and the law and brought them down. It wasn't me, God. And so, so God's like, Joshua, it's your time to lead. I want you to be strong and courageous. I want to pick up in verse 3. This is what he goes on to tell him. He said, I'm promising you something. He said, I promise you what I promised Moses. All right, so now he's got Joshua's attention. Same thing I promised Moses, I'm promising you. Wherever you set foot, you will be on land I have given you. Now think about that promise for a moment. Wherever you set foot... I'm giving you that land. Now, could you imagine if someone told you, hey, there's all this land out here. I own it, but I'm going to give it to you. All you got to do is step foot on on it. And wherever you step foot, that land is yours. At the price the property's going for right now, what would you do? You wouldn't walk, would you? (laughs) You'd be running. I mean, you'd be panting. I want all that I can get, right? Because that's how we are. We just be running through whatever, you know. And so God's saying, wherever you set foot, you're going to be on land that I've already gone before you. I've already given you. So here's my question for each and every one of us today. Where do you set foot? Throughout the course of a day, throughout the course of a week, where do you go? Where do you set foot? Because when we look at the theme of God's word from the very beginning to the end, this is a theme throughout Scripture. This is what God has called us to. If we're going to personalize it, there's this timeless bridge where God's word applied to them back then and how it applies to us today. And so I think God's asking us, where do you set foot? Because wherever you go, I'm giving you the land. I'm going to explain this here in a moment. What God has called us to and what God has given us as Christ followers is spiritual influence. And that's what the book of Joshua is all about. Yes, it's known as the conquest period where Joshua is leading God's people into the promised land to take the land back that God promised Abraham. And then they went down to, to, eat, to Egypt during the famine, during the time of Jacob, right? And then God used Moses to lead his people out of Egypt for four, a little over four centuries. They were just mistreated. They became slaves, right, during the latter part of that whole time. All right, and so now he sets them free. Now they're right on the verge of going into all that God has promised for them. And God tells Joshua, wherever you set foot, I'm giving you this land. It's all about spiritual influence. So much corruption in the land. So much corruption in culture. And I'm calling you to go in and lead my people. And it's about spiritual influence. I want to just kind of put this bullet point up here on the screen when it comes to where we set foot. Understanding as Christ followers that God has given you Christ-like spiritual influence wherever you set foot. All right? I want us to grasp this. God has given each and every one of us, if you profess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, He gives every one of us as Christ followers Christ-like spiritual influence wherever we set foot foot. And we see that throughout scripture. This is what God has called us to. So the question comes back to where do we set foot? And the thing we have to understand is that God, he's got Joshua in the you know, locker room giving him this pep talk. But the reality is, is that he says, look, wherever you set foot, you, you know, it's going to be yours, but he just can't stand there. So that's great. That's great. There's no passive response to it, right? We have to actively engage in it. We have to actively step forward into what God has called us to, what God has promised us. It's the same for Joshua. He couldn't have a passive response. He had to have an active response and respond in order to walk into what God had promised his people. And the same applies for us today. We cannot afford to be passive today. We are in the middle of a spiritual battle. And as we're studying the book of Joshua, we're talking about how God is cultivating this heart in Joshua to become a great warrior for him and his kingdom, the purposes of his kingdom, to take God's spiritual influence into the land and change the land for the glory of his God. And it's the same that holds true for us today. So here's the deal. Put this next bullet point up here. Spiritual influence comes as we actively live out our faith in Christ with ourselves, daily connecting with the living God in our own personal journeys, growing in our spiritual faith, all right? And if we're married, in your marriages, 
All right? Having just that, that spiritual influence in our marriages with one another. Iron sharpens iron as one person sharpens another. In our families, in our community, in our church community, in our state, in our nation, in the world. This is what God has called us to. But spiritual influence comes as we are actively living out our faith in Christ. We cannot afford to be passive. God has called each and every one of us to be spiritual warriors. When we studied Nehemiah, we moved into this building a little over a year ago, right? We talked about where Nehemiah said, fight for your families, right? Because everything that we're up against, we're in the middle of a spiritual battle. We need to fight for what God has called us to. So what I want to do is, how many of you remember doing the connect the dots when you were a kid? right? You couldn't really see what the image was, and you drew the little dots. I don't even know if they do those anymore. But I want to do today is I want to kind of do kind of some connecting the dots in Scripture, understanding how what's going on in Joshua is a theme throughout the entire Bible. And I want to go all the way back to the very beginning of God's Word. And, and years ago, when we were homeschooling our kids, I remember reading some stuff by, by um, a Christian scientist, the guy who started the Creation Museum and, and the Ark Encounter. How many of you have ever been there? If you've not been there, it's just a great thing to go check out. It's just really amazing, just learning the things, you know, that God did in his word. And I just remember Ken Ham talking about that if we carry presuppositions into what God tells us in his word, our presuppositions will lead us to the wrong destination of where God has for us in the truth of his word. And so we got to have to set aside our presuppositions of what we think God says and what we think God is like and let God's word speak for itself the way God intended for it to speak, without all of our cultural influence that get imposed in it as we read it, okay? So I'm going to go back to the very beginning, because the starting point is so important. So in the very beginning, it talks about how God created everything. He called the earth, you know, into existence, and then he starts creating all these, these animals and all the different species of animals, right? And, and he looks down, and he says, it is good. There's birds in the sky and swarms of all these creatures in the sea, and then God creates mankind. All right, let's pick up in verse 26. Just understanding that this spiritual influence is what we were created for. Starting in verse 26, then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. I'm just going to pause there for a moment. Okay, God says, let's make, let us make human beings. Now, scholars will say this is evidence of the Trinity. You know, God is not speaking to the angels. He's not speaking to to someone else. It's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit actively engaged in the creation of everything and the creation of mankind. Because when we read John's gospel, John says in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. All right? The Word was God. Okay? So, So this is what's going on here. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. Now that is a key thing to understand. Let's go on to verse 27. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Now, this is so significant. And I'm just going to be hitting on just little pieces of this, on how God created each and every one of us. Right? And he created them for a purpose. He created them with intentionality. Everything that God does, he does it with purpose and intentionality. And being made in the image of God, it says the thing that makes us in the image of God is one, we're like him. We're going to break this down here in just a moment. And he created them, male and female. He created them. Let's go on to verse 28. All right, verse 28 says this, that God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it. Now we know that in the creation account that when God's there in the garden with the man and the woman, he gave them some specific guidelines and commands. And there was one tree in the middle of the garden. He said, don't eat of its fruit. Don't go near it, don't eat of it, don't touch it, don't even think about it. Because as soon as you do, you will what? You will die. All right, you will die. So so here's the deal. Satan comes along. We see we're in the middle of a spiritual battle. Satan comes along, and he said, is that really what God meant? And what Satan does is he presents a false image that if you give in to this, if you eat of this fruit, God knows that, that you will be more like him. They were already made in the image of God. All right? But he got them to buy into a different image, a worldly image, a false image that just impacted everything, which we know brought sin into the world and brought sin into all of creation, brought sin into what the image of God is, that it no longer reflected the image of its creator. 
And it just made a mess of everything. But then God gives this command as we're in the image of God. And he says we're to be fruitful and multiply and to fill the earth and govern it. So what I want to do is I want to break down what it means to be created to the image of God. And then we're going to go back to Joshua. How this theme, this promise, this command that God's giving Joshua as he's going into the land is the same thing that God gave Adam and Eve in the very beginning in the garden. That goes all the way through scripture. So what it means to be created in the image of God. The first part of it is that we were created to have a relationship with God and with people. We were created by the creator for relationship. God wanted a creation that he could relate with. We are so unique from all of creation that we can have this personal relationship with a living God, our creator. He designed us that way. No other creature on this planet is like that but mankind. That's how we were created in his image, to be in relationship with him. All right, that is such a big deal. We are spiritual beings, created, and physical beings at the same time, created to have this incredible relationship with God. This is what Jesus said in John 17, verse 3. We're talking about this in our men's group this past Wednesday on what is eternal life. All right, and this is eternal life. This is what Jesus said. Now, this is eternal life, that they what? That they know you, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. It's all about relationship. What Jesus was teaching when he was here on earth some 2,000 years ago was that God's intention for him coming was to make us right with him, that we could be in right relationship with him. It's all about spiritual influence. It all kind of flows out of this. But the first part of spiritual influence is that we have to be in right relationship with God. God created us to be in relationship with him. Yet if we get our image and our identity from this false image and this false identity, the enemy tries to rob. As Jesus said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I've come to you may have life and have it abundantly. And if we buy into this false image and this false identity that the enemy tries to get us to buy into, then we will not be able to walk into the promises and the blessings that God has in store for his creation. We don't have this right relationship that God created us for. All right. So the first thing is God created us to be in this relationship with him. But we know that sin has made a mess of everything. And this is what Joshua was getting ready to walk into. It's just a mess in this, this land of Canaan. All right? The second part of being made in the image of God is not only to be for relationship, but we're to reflect the image of God in both character and the conduct of our lives. So we're made to be in relationship with God, but we're also to reflect his image. We're like little reflectors of the image of our creator. And the manner, the conduct of our lives is to reflect the very image of God. This is what the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. He wrote, For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. That's where true freedom is. But the enemy wants people to believe that freedom is something else in somewhere else. But true freedom is only when we are in right relationship with the living God, the way he created us, the way he designed us, and that we're reflecting the very image of our creator. And so he says that's where the spirit, where freedom is, that the spirit of the Lord is freedom. Verse 18, so all of us who have had that veil removed, he's referring to how before we came to faith in Christ, the enemy has put a veil over our minds so that we don't believe. But when we come to faith in Christ, that veil is removed. And now we can see the very thing that God intended for us to be. And so it says, all of us who had that veil removed can see and what? Reflect the glory of the Lord. That's what we're called to do, to reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord who is the Spirit makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. You see, we're image bearers. So when we think back, you know, how many of you learned the Ten Commandments when you were kids? Maybe you grew up in church, learned the Ten Commandments. Now, how many of you, you know, the one that stood out the most in the Ten Commandments was, you shall not take the Lord's name in vain. Now, how many of you have taken the Lord's name in vain? I'm just kidding. Don't raise your hand. <laughs> right? But we're always conscientious of that, right? Right? You know, it's like, I can't say that word. I can't say that word. I'm not going to say Jesus, you know, and, and when I'm mad or something, right? I'm not going to say this, you know. So we try not. Well, the thing is, is that we misunderstood that whole thing. What it means to take the Lord's name in vain is to no longer represent his image. That's what it means. 
We were created to reflect the very image of our God. And when we stop it, that's when we're taking the Lord's name in vain. We no longer reflect the very God that he created us to be in relationship with and to reflect his image, his glorious image. And the third R that comes to being made in the image of God is that we are to reproduce. And we're to reproduce godly offspring, both physically and spiritually. You see, in the very beginning, when God created everything, he didn't, he, when he comes to mankind, he didn't just, you know, God the Father didn't turn to God the Son and say, you know what, let's just make a bunch of people just so we can just fill this cool planet that we just made. The goal wasn't just to put a bunch of people on the planet. The goal, when he, when he commanded the, the man and the woman that they were to be in right relationship with him, they were to reflect his image, that they were to reproduce godly offspring, image bearers. And so that's what Christ comes to restore. So the word Christian, when it first shows up in the book of Acts, it means little Christs, Christ ones. You see, this theme, as I'm trying to connect the dots, goes all the way through Scripture. This is what God created us for, that we're to create offspring. And, and for those that are married, we have kids, we're to raise up godly offspring, pass on the truths of the faith of God's Word, helping them understand how God created them, who God created them to be, reflecting His image. The image of the creator. And then, and then for us spiritually, we, we're going to see here in the New Testament, God created us to continue this spiritually with others. So let's go back and look at what God told Abraham. Just kind of connecting the dots through scripture. So when Abraham comes on the scene, God told Abraham, I will make you what? Extremely fruitful. All right? Now what did God tell Adam and Eve? He said, be fruitful and multiply. God calls Abraham, before his name was Abraham, his name was Abram, right? Which meant exalted father. And God's like, look, the focus isn't going to be on you as this wealthy, exalted father. I'm going to change your name. When we come to faith in Christ, God gives us a new name in him, a new identity in him. And he says, your name is no longer Abram, but it's going to be Abraham because you are going to be a father of a multitude. I am going to bless you. All of the earth is going to be blessed through you. And he said, I will make you extremely fruitful. Now, I'm sitting there thinking, if I heard God say that promise, and then Abraham, we know about Abraham, he lived almost an entire life without ever being able to have a kid, right? Because Sarah's womb was barren. So then Abraham decided, well, maybe God meant this. So he grabs his maidservant, Hagar, and makes a mess of everything, right? <laughs> Right? So easy to do. We fall into the, the, the desires of the flesh and we make a mess of everything. We, we kind of want to presuppose what God says. But then God opens Sarah's womb, who was beyond childbearing years. This miraculous thing that God does because God was after something much greater, something spiritual. And the Jews, they understand this. When they read God's word, they understand they're image bearers. That's why they say Father Abraham. It's a spiritual heritage, not a physical heritage. And that's what God has called us to in Christ. So we fast forward the clock, thousands of years, to Jesus when he comes on the scene. And Jesus is with his followers. And this is what Jesus told his followers. John 15, 8. He said, this is to my Father's glory that you what? Bear you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Now, what Jesus is talking about here, the same thing we're going back and look at Joshua, he says you bear much fruit. He's talking about two things. It's kind of twofold. One is that we know in Galatians, it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. All right, we're to reflect the image of the Creator and our godly character. And, and words, some, some of the older translations in the New Testament talks about let your conversation be seasoned with salt. That word conversation refers to your manner of life. It was just a figure of speech. It wasn't just our words. It was every part of our life. And so Jesus is saying, you're to reflect. You're to bear much fruit. But it wasn't just, just the fruit of the Spirit. It was that they were to share the good news of Christ with others and make spiritual children, children of the faith. That was the intention in the very beginning in the garden. 
to reproduce godly offspring. Jesus comes and makes us, gives us, makes us a way for us to be made right with God, be in right relationship with God so we can reflect his image and so we can reproduce godly offspring. He created us for spiritual influence. So in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, very similar to what God told Joshua, he tells his disciples, Jesus tells his disciples, he said he told them, go into all the world, wherever you set foot, Go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone because it's all about Christ-like spiritual influence. Taking what God has entrusted us as God entrusted it to Joshua in his day. Jesus entrusted it to his disciples and he's entrusted that all the way down to generations to us today. It's our time. She heard me say to lead, to move forward into the land everywhere we set foot. And to proclaim the good news of Christ. So once again, I ask, where do you set foot? Because the Lord your God has gone before you. He's prepared you. And now he's giving you the pep talk to be strong and courageous. So let's go back to Joshua, looking at verse 3 again. He's telling Joshua, I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set foot, you will be on land I have given you. And then we see this theme goes all the way through Scripture. God has created us for spiritual influence, godly, Christ-like spiritual influence to go against the grain of culture, to go into all the challenges that we face every day in an ever-changing culture. We talked about that last week with the good news of Christ. This is what he tells him in verse 5. God's still giving him this pep talk. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live, for I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you. Now, what a great promise, right? So here's the deal, Joshua. No one's going to be able to stand against you. It's not because Joshua was a great warrior, and it's not because the Israelites were vast and powerful people, because they weren't. It's because our God is a great God. And God has a plan. And God has a purpose. That he's calling Joshua to lead God's people into the land. Have spiritual influence to go in and to change the world. And to change culture. The way God intended it. To restore what the enemy robbed all of us from the very beginning. And got us to buy into a false image of who God was. And so he's, he's challenging him. He's giving Miss pep talk. No one's going to be able to stand against you. I will be with you. Remember the last series. Those who were with us. We're talking about the promises of God. Twice in that series, we're talking about Jesus said, look, I'm, I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to be with the Father, but I'm not going to leave you alone. I will always be with you because I'm sending the Spirit. Same thing. We see this consistency in Scripture. I will be with you. Jesus said, I'm not going to fail you. I'm not going to abandon you. We see the same thing, and he's telling them this. And so we see the Apostle Paul as he wrote a church from prison to the, to the Philippians, right? And as he has nothing, he's writing from a prison cell, and he says these words that most of you probably know. A lot of sports teams will use it as their slogan where he says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength or who strengthens me, Right? It's the same thing. God's telling Joshua, you're gonna, nothing's going to stand in your way. I am with you. You can do everything because I am with you every step of the way. Nothing will come against you. The Apostle Paul, as he's wrapping up his letter to the church at Rome, he says, guys, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our God is with us. Our God is for us. And he's challenging. He's got Joshua in the locker room giving him this pep talk. And let's go on to verse 6. So he goes on. He says, Joshua, here's the deal. I'm with you. Same thing I promised to Moses. I'm promising you. So here's the deal. Be strong and courageous. For you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to their ancestors. I, will, I would give them. Verse 7, the beginning of it. Be strong and very courageous. He's saying, he says this to him multiple times. It's evidence that, that Joshua's a little timid. There's no way I'm taking that candy bar into the promised land and praying for somebody. <laughs> that scares me to death. There's giants in the land. There's a lot of great warriors in the land, walled cities in the land that are well fortified. We have no weapons. We got a lot of riches that we plundered from Egypt. There's no way. I'm not Moses, God. God says, Joshua, be strong 
and courageous. I'm calling you to this. Be strong and very courageous. This is about spiritual influence. This is your spiritual heritage. This is the land that I've called you to. This is the land that I've placed you in. I'm calling you to have Christ-like spiritual influence in the land. Be strong and courageous and get moving because wherever your feet step, that's the land I'm giving you. Now, any of you that's played sports and been in the locker room when the coach is giving that pep talk, you know, everybody kind of puts their hands out there together like, go team, right? And they're all excited and they're ready to go. But then there's one last thing that God says, okay, I know you're all courage, Joshua. You're ready to go. You got your courage. You're ready to do this. You know you got me. I'm backing you. I'm with you every step of the way. Everywhere you go, it's, the land is yours because I'm giving it to you. But here's the deal. There's one more important precursor that you've got to have in place or it's not going to happen. This is what it says in the rest of verse 7 and verse 8. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Now, what he's referring to here is God's word. At this point, it's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The first five books, known as the Torah. All right, this is the first five books that are given through Moses to God's people. It changed the world when the law was given what God expected of his people, all right? Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them. Why? Because the temptation to deviate from them will come, as we know, as we go on through the book, right? Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do, not success the way the world defines success the way God defines success. You'll be successful in everything you do. And then he goes on as if God's saying, let me clarify what I mean. Verse 8, study this book of instruction continually. I know you've heard me say this. Sometimes I feel like a broken record, but I'm telling you, I've done so many weddings in the years I've been in ministry, and almost every time when I sit down with young couples, and I sit there and I look him in the eye and I said, are you spending time with God and his word? Nine times out of ten, it's no. How do you expect your marriage to last if you're not connected with your author of life, the author of life, the creator of your life? If you're not connected with the living God, and I'm not saying this to guilt you guys, I'm saying this to challenge you. This is what God's given Joshua this pep talk. He said, here's the deal you got to continually be in my word. Don't deviate from it. you got to study it. This book of instruction, continually meditate on it day and night so you be, be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all that you do. How important is that for us today? We're bombarded with so much information more than anything that Joshua had to compare with. Right? And the enemy's trying to take our kids trying to take a whole generation to buy into a false image of what it means to be like God and who God is and keeping them away from the very thing that God created them for. And so God says, study this book. This is the prerequisite. Study the book of the law. Meditate on it day and night so you're careful to do everything that is written in it. And only then will you be prosperous and successful in everything you will do. And so as we move forward and we, we wrestle through some of the challenges that are going on in our culture today, as I, as I mentioned last week, you know, we live in such an oversensitive culture that you can't even say words without starting fights and arguments. If there's one thing social media has taught us, it's taught us to be spiritually and relationally immature. We don't know how to communicate. All we know how to do is state our opinion and close the door, right? We got to start conversations. We got to initiate them. We got to be a part of them. And we got to have ears to hear and to listen so that we can have Christ-like spiritual influence in a world that desperately needs Jesus. And it's only as we do this that God is going to bless us to be prosperous and successful and to move into the culture and the land that we live in to change the world with the good news of Christ. And so in closing, he, he tells Joshua this in verse 9. He said, once again, he said, this is my command. 
He's telling him just to do these things. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. That same principle holds true for us today. And I'm playing coach today, and I'm here, and we got her all here in the locker room, and I know there's those of you that are watching from home. And as your coach, I'm challenging you, be strong and courageous. Be in the book. We're going to wrestle through these things as we go forward as a church, things that culture is wrestling with, and we're going to understand it from a biblical perspective, not with presuppositions that culture imposes on God's word, but what God tells us in his word, letting him speak to us. Because we live in a culture where there is no absolute truth. We live in a world that likes fluidity. Anything is fluid. And it will always change and it'll constantly be changing as I talked about last week. But God has given us his word as an anchor, as a constant, as an absolute that has withstood the same challenges going on in culture today happened thousands of years ago. It's no different then than it is today. Amen. Let's pray.